Unicorn Overlord is one of the best RPGs that I've played in a very long time. It is technically a TRPG or an SRPG, a tactical or strategy RPG, but that means that if you like Fire Emblem, you will like this game. If you like Final Fantasy Tactics or Tactics Ogre, you will like this game. If you kind of have a thing for RTS games to a certain degree, or even a little bit of 4X, you'll probably like this game. N not if you only like those. You need to like the RPGs, but then also that. But it's a huge game that tries to do a lot of different things and does most of them incredibly well. I have some complaints. We'll get into that later. I have not finished the game. I am playing the game on expert. I am a little bit over halfway through and it's been about 40 hours, 40 ish, a little bit more. And I do suspect how some of the criticisms can occur because for a large portion of my playthrough, I kept thinking that there were outlets that gave this game an 8 out of 10 and I couldn't understand why. I still don't, but I can see how maybe it could happen. So anyways, I'm Mug Thief. Hi, welcome. I like to talk about games, review games. I do big analysis on games. This time I'm bringing you my very in-depth opinions on Unicorn Overlord and why I think you should play this game. So let's start off with the weakest part. I'm talking about the story. Story is kind of what you expect. It's a little bit more political, a little bit more grounded. It is not revolutionary. If you are familiar with Vanillaware, who are the developers of this game, they're the people behind Dragon's Crown and Odin Sphere and recently 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim. This little puppy right here, great game. The story is not to the level of 13 Sentinels, which I think is a better game when it comes to the story. This is a much different beast, but of the same quality that this studio puts out and with that same identity, especially in the art style. So it's not the most basic story in the world. It does try and be a little bit more adult at times in the sense of it's not afraid to talk about political intrigue, a little bit of that Game of Thrones, that Sanderson vibe, if you will. And that's actually when I think the game does it best. It has a good balance between a lot of different characters and their interactions going from wholesome and good character writing and, and a lot of fun stuff going on, some very good voice acting going on in the game, and a main story that is pretty well done. You are the heir to a throne of a country, and the entire continent is being consumed by really big bad guy. So you are going to be the commander of the Liberation Army, and that requires you going to all five of the provinces, your starting province, and four others, and fixing some of the problems regarding the occupation of this, and liberating them and finding your allies and getting stronger along the way. Now, while the story itself, at least so far, has not been excellent, it's very serviceable in creating the scale of the situation, which is one of the things I love the most about this game. And this goes not just for the story, but for everything. The more you play of the game, the better and better it becomes. Now, I might be crazy, but I generally think that a lot of strategy RPGs, your Fire Emblems, for example, tend to get better as you keep going. They tend to peak at the end, which is one of my favorite parts about them it's one of my favorite parts about rpgs in general is that they have this progression where they don't peak at midpoint normally right they, they keep getting grander and grander the scale is bigger the size of the battles the craziness of the gear in this case how much you have to strategize and how many things you have to take into account throughout the game they keep getting bigger and bigger as new things happen the scenarios are larger, the story gets more complicated, more characters are involved. And this framework of you have to travel all over the land and reunite everybody to fight against the oppressor lends itself really well to creating the situation where it's believable that you're going from this small ragtag group of liberation to then being something that when you show up at somebody's door, they're genuinely impressed or as you progress, more people have heard about you and know what to expect. And you're getting yourself from these scraps of trying to take over pieces of land and liberating land battle by battle into these enormous fights, castles and stuff that really hits home in satisfaction of as you are building through this in its story, in its gameplay, in its tactics, through everything. It just culminates in having that grandiose scale feel so good. Which is also another way of saying the game starts out a little bit slow. 
you might not really get it at the start. I think it does a wonderful job of introducing things not too fast and not too slow. And it's also one of the main reasons why I think that the demo is not good enough. I connected to the game after the demo ends. I was having a good time. I was enjoying it, but I had some caveats. But it's one of those games that after you've put in 15, 20 hours, your mind just is on autopilot. You understand all of the mechanics and how to use them and you move through the menus and through the battlefield and you position everything like without having to think about where things are you just know every single combination of buttons to okay now i want to move this unit here but i want to relay their movement to stop here so that they don't get hit by this and this it just comes automatically to you so to, to wrap up on the demo point if you like the demo if you go play the free demo and it's enough for you you're like that was okay. Like you're into it, maybe not immediately sold. You're like, I had fun, but I don't know if this is for me. It's probably for you. You should probably pick this game up because it only gets exponentially better from there. So let's talk about how the game is set up. By the time that you're really liberating your first area, you're going to be playing a game where you have 10 units and each unit can be formed of up to six individual members. This is not fire emblem in that sense there is also no grid this is a real-time game in the sense that you set people where they want to go and kind of like an rts you hit play and then they move towards a location and then things happen and you have to adjust to it. it it really does sometimes feel like a very strange rts where you are micromanaging but under the hood how things are interacting is very much like a tactical rpg especially in how these units are formed with these members now you have to upgrade your way there, so you have to unlock new unit slots and then you have to unlock the ability for each of those units to have more members. But you're going to spend a pretty hefty amount of time with 10 units with four members each. And you want to make each of these have a, a build of sorts. This is one of the bigger differences compared to something like maybe just regular old Final Fantasy Tactics or Fire Emblem is that each unit isn't simply an archetype that you throw out onto the field. You actually have to build the units. If you want to have an anti-tank unit, you need anti-tank members that have classes that are good to take down tanks, but you also have to keep in mind how are they going to sustain themselves? How are they going to defend against the enemy? And you have to pick the members that most suit what you want that unit to accomplish. And it feels very satisfying to put together a very strong unit. You then deploy those units out on the field and you go do whatever your objective is. So that might already sound complicated. And I want you to remember, I told you before, the, the game does a really good job of introducing things piece by piece. Because as I keep describing things, it's normal if you start to feel overwhelmed, okay? Added complexity to these systems comes from your equipment loadout. So every single member of every unit can have different equipment and they can be very transformative. You can have a, an entire unit function around the combination of items, for example. And when I say they're transformative, for example, every base unit has one active ability and one passive ability. So they can do two different things in each combat they enter. There are items that give you extra points for passive abilities or for active abilities. So that would make that member that you put it on attack twice or heal twice. When you promote units eventually, they baseline come with two and two, and you can put that up to three and three. So these items, that's just a very basic example of how items can get, but they can be more creative and add different solutions to problems. On top of that, all of those abilities that you can do, and some items and weapons do come with their own unique abilities that you can use, can be programmed. And the easiest way to describe it is the gambit system from final fantasy 12 it's basically a logic tactics board so you could say okay if at any point during a battle one of the members of this unit falls under 75 percent, i want you to cast heal on them and if you don't do that as a baseline for most healers for example if anybody takes any damage at all they will heal but maybe you don't want them to heal maybe you want them to cleanse debuffs or maybe you want them to use an offensive skill so you have to manually go in and say, hey, don't heal unless somebody is under 75% or under 50%. Maybe don't use the AOE heal until the average HP is below a certain point because it's better for you to use those points that you have on a different skill. And you can 
logically program all of those things in the order that you want them to work and under what conditions which members of each unit should use what ability. The final result of this as the game progresses and progresses is that later on you will have fights with units that have four or five members each. Each of those members is taking four to five actions based on different conditions of what's going on and so is your opponent. And those animations, which you can speed up, are still going to result in very long battles that you can skip at any moment. And you will be spending a lot of time in this game very quickly skipping through battles, by the way. Just directly, you make two units clash, which is going to give, which enters them into combat, and you're just going to press the start button, which is going to skip that combat. You already know the results. It's very clear. It shows it to you. And the reason that you watch the battles is to figure out why you're losing or why you're winning and what you can tweak in the logic of the units to make them stronger. So although it's very cool and flashy to see them fight and it can be very satisfying, the incentive to watch your units fight others, aside from maybe you get pleasure from watching the cool animations, is actually to study up, to check what's going on and why. And when you see something that's like, oh, that shouldn't happen, and you immediately open up and go, okay, don't do this unless this. And you keep polishing up your units and making them stronger through your smarts, right? Through you being perceptive, uh, realizing what the enemy does or certain abilities that you're being countered by and how with the same tools you had, but using them better, you can overcome it. And that little puzzle element to me, really good. Love that sort of stuff in games. Now, this might lead some of you, especially Fire Emblem fans, to be like, what do you mean you don't watch the combats? That's one of the most fun parts about Fire Emblem is watching the combats. Well, because there's no crit rate here. You can crit, but there's no RNG. There's no RNG at all. When your units level up, they will always obtain the same stat points based on the growth rates that you set. You can modify that, but there's no, oh, I got lucky and this unit got, you know, a ton of different points on level up. There is no percentage to crit. And then when you watch the fight you're like you see the little crit animation you're like oh my god yes in a very clutch moment i won i do sometimes miss that but it's just a choice i don't think it's worse this game lays it all on the table when you go to fight somebody what it says is what's going to happen before you fight them it tells you something there are some things that can affect it which lead to those moments of oh i screwed up right because they can have assists from other units there can be other environmental effects. There can be a lot of different stuff that can influence a fight. So what you might check as, oh, if I fight them, I'm going to win. Then you can go in and suddenly it's there. It's visible. You had to mentally account for the danger, but it doesn't show you the stats until you're going to fight. And then it just tells you, oh, you're going to you're going to lose. You're just going to lose this fight. But there is no hidden, oh, wow, I hit a crit, so I won a fight that I shouldn't have. You're not going to get that rush here. Instead, of the rush you're going to get is understanding everything about the scenario, configuring a unit that can overcome the combat puzzle that the game puts in front of you. There's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. We haven't even talked about Valor. So the way that you deploy more units, the way that you use special abilities on the map in this game is with Valor points. You defeat enemies, you obtain valor. It's a resource that you can then use for a whole host of buffs, debuffs, to attack enemies, to resurrect your units, to all sorts of different things. And it's a, an extra layer of economy decision that you have to make during each fight. A lot of them are tied to resting and stamina. Each unit has a maximum number of moves they can do in combat against somebody. You can move freely whenever you want, but you might have six, five, or four different stamina points if you enter combat that number of times, you then cannot move. You can still fight back if people attack you. So you can create a choke with characters that are at zero stamina. If you're that type of Fire Emblem player, by the way, unite. We are stronger together. But to move again, if you are at zero, when you can't move, you need to rest. And when you rest, your characters do nothing. Your mem the members of that unit will not move. You can just get destroyed. So you need to set up strategically how you're going to protect units to rest and how you're going to catch things up. And again, all of this is something that the game introduces very naturally with a lot of stages that are very smartly designed to prioritize certain mechanics and teach you this is how you're supposed to deal with this sort of thing, or at least these are the options of what you can do with it. And that's the game. 
you keep progressing, you keep liberating stuff, and you march towards the end with all of the story. All of your characters, all of the individual members of every unit have rapport and they have different conversations and stuff like that. But those conversations, very Fire Emblem-like, take place on the overworld, which is not Fire Emblem-like. Because that huge nation that you have to put back together, that's a major overworld. You can explore it, you can encounter different areas to liberate, you can encounter side quests, and as you keep engaging in more and more quests, you will slowly liberate the world, which will give you a secondary resource called Honors, and will increase your overall renown. Renown gates what types of upgrades you can buy with Honor, and Honor gets you the upgrades. Things like more units, more members in each unit, and then eventually promoting classes as well. But you are exploring this overworld. There are small puzzles, things to find, a bunch of different stuff all over the place to discover, to enjoy, to have fun with in, in a game that is just very, very big and has a lot of content. And that content is very good. Even the smallest side quest can lead to a very unique scenario, which is something that Fire Emblem sometimes lacks and I don't feel is lacking here is that I've been consistently surprised by the scenarios that the game presents. It's not just route the enemies in a pretty boring looking map. There are a lot of gimmicks, a lot of twists, a lot of changes to objectives. You have to control every outpost and you're being assaulted from everywhere. You have to resist an ambush. You have to rescue somebody while holding off somebody else. So you can't let the enemies reach one outpost, but you have to rescue somebody else on the other side. You have to storm a castle. There are siege weapons. There are ballista that you can occupy. There's a lot of strategy around environments and holding certain points of the map with units that can assist from those positions for free, adding a lot of damage to everything that happens, but they're highly contested and you have to strategize around them. This is a game that is undeniably very dense, and I thought it was going to be a little bit overwhelming. At the at start, I thought it was underwhelming, then I got a little bit overwhelmed, but once the pieces clicked, if this seems like the type of game where the pieces will click for you, where you can go through it, enjoy the process and have those things click into place it is phenomenal once everything is firing on all cylinders i think it's going to be very difficult for it to not be one of the best games of the year or and one of the best rpgs of the year in a year where we have a tremendous lineup of rpgs coming i do have some problems with it many of them have dissipated and i have suspicions on what the problems could be my first big problem, aside from some of the changes I described from other SRPGs, were kind of difficult for me to adapt to at the start, and then I got over it, is the time limit. So missions have a time limit, and you have to complete it in that time limit. If you don't, though, you can spend one of the resources in the game that I have at least found to be quite plentiful to double the time limit. And double is more than enough to clear absolutely anything. So once I understood that this was just a resource that I was going to use for, oh, this is very big climactic battle. I'm going to stress over a lot of decisions and I'm not going to make the time limit. I could just kind of let go of it for a little bit, know that I was going to double that time limit and beat it without worrying about it. But in the beginning, that did stress me out. I was like, man, this game would be so much cooler if I could chill out a little bit. But then once you realize that, it wasn't that big of a deal. The other problem is difficulty. I don't know how the difficulty scaling is going to work on others, but I am playing on expert. That's how I normally like to play these sorts of games. For me, the difficulty has been perfect so far, but it is a very open-ended game. Once the map is open to you, you always have multiple options of where to go, what side quest to do, and even what main quest to go down. At the very start, it gives you one that very clearly is more difficult and one that's easier, but then by the time you finish the easier one, you might be a little bit over leveled for the other one that used to be harder. So there's flexibility in this. And I do think that there is a possibility that you will over level. You will do too many side activities and just be a little bit too strong. And if you don't do those side activities, by the time you go back and do them, you might be over leveled. I haven't really encountered that so far, which feels like magic to me, because how is that even possible? But that has been my experience on Expert so far. But I can understand that maybe now that all my characters are a little bit over level 20 and I have a good chunk of the game left, 
how you could end up being overpowered and trivializing a lot of stuff in the game that could be very cool and very fun if you weren't over level. That has not been the case so far, at least the progression for me seems to be one. Well, I have to finish right now upgrading all of my units, promoting them. And then after that, I imagine that the power is going to come from continuing to level up, reaching level cap, maxing out the equipment, perfecting the equipment of all of them. And that will keep that progression more or less steady all the way towards the end game, where I imagine that in a game that has this much side content, they very carefully balanced out those final encounters to to be difficult, to require some investment, which is what I would prefer. If you don't like how that sounds, there's three difficulty levels under expert. So there's something here for everybody. That is the only thing I'm worried about. And to be honest, I'm worried about it because I'm having such a great time playing through it that I don't want the, the balance as it is right now to ever end. But yes, those are my opinions on Unicorn Overlord. I would love to give a very big analysis of this game. You know, one of those hour plus long hour 20 videos about this game i don't know if i will do that so please leave a like if you think this game is interesting i'm also trying something different with this video i have my usual list of notes but i'm trying to go a bit more off script and if you like this format let me know let me know in the comments below let me know what you think of unicorn overlord and also let me know about that big analysis because the truth of the matter is i have a full-time job I make a lot of YouTube videos, I like talking about a lot of different things, and those big videos take up a lot of time and slow down the regular pace of videos in the back end while I try and make them. So it's a it's a big effort. So even though I would like to, if that's not something appealing to people, I don't want to spend 70 or 80 hours editing that video when I could be doing other stuff with other games and bringing other things to the attention of people or about other things related to consumer advocacy or other practices, you know, the usual things that I do. So let me know. I've been Mug Thief. If you enjoyed this, the best way to catch more of it is to subscribe. Thank you for watching. Thank you to my lovely patrons for supporting me. Link in the description. And as always, I will see you again very soon.